Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to another episode of NPH Live Photography Conversations. My name is Tunde, and today we have a very special guest. Known as a street photography legend, we'll be talking to street and documentary photographer Bernard Callum. Better known to you and me as Kabeni. He'll be sharing his story, tips, and experiences as Fujifilm's only official ambassador in Nigeria. So Kabeni, if you are here, I believe you are here. Please request to join this live. My name is Bernard Carlo. I'm a visual artist. My medium is photography. I use the camera. I'm based in Lagos, Nigeria. Amongst all, all the kind of photography I do, I do a lot of street photography. It's one of my favorite genres of photography. From initially wanting to be a computer engineer, how exactly did photography come into your life? I actually didn't decide to be a photographer till about um, till I was done with school. Like I was way done with the university before I made the plunge. But while I was was in school, um, around my second year, I, I got a gift. Uh, one of my uncles, oh my aunt, actually gifted me a small camera. Uh, what, what you call the point and shoot camera? And I think that camera foiled like like planted that seed in me. But it was until I did my IT at the time, uh, was when I was done with my IT, it was clear to me that I was not going to tow the 9 to 5 line, I was going to do something different. But even at that time, I didn't know what it was going to be, but I just knew that, uh, man, I didn't think I was going to do regular, I wasn't going to get into that regular programming of, uh, you know, 9 to 5 design. So um, I finished school, then came to Lagos, and eventually bumped into photography, yeah. Like you said, you were given a point-and-shoot camera. Yeah. From what I know, you you had, like, several cameras at first. You had a point-and-shoot. You had an Olympus E410, a Nikon, and then Fuji. And a Fuji yeah. uh, uh, Fuji XE1, right? Am I correct? Yeah, right? first generation, yeah. And so, I'm going to ask you, ask you a question. As you transitioned from camera to camera, what ways did you did you see yourself grow as a photographer? It's interesting you brought up the Olympus beat. <laughs> uh, it was... F- funny thing is, most of the cameras I got, like, from the beginning were usually were mostly gifts. Like, the point and shoot one was a gift. Then the E410 was also a gift. And that was mm-hmm. when I... Okay, it was when I got the E410, I said I was going to do photography. I started trying to do photography. I uh, started looking for events. Because at the time, you know how the general belief is that, oh, the cash cow, like the cash cow of the business cash cow of photography is event. You know? So at the time, I had uh, started um, picking for avenues to second shoot or to looking for people that I could hang around that were doing weddings at the time I could shoot with. So, um, so I, I started with that Olympus E410. Then um, it wasn't it wasn't given like they were just it was limited at the time it was quite limited and um, I had to like I literally had to get something else and eventually the what I what, what got was a Nikon um, D seven thousand mm. yeah and I used that for a while and it was while I was using the D seven thousand that um, someone reached out to me a friend of mine his name is um, his photography name is Ace Photo- is it Ace Photography yeah. So he reached out, he said he had like some he had a camera for sale. I was like, okay, what kind of camera? He said, oh, that. At the time I'd already started trying to take street pictures on the street out, maybe using my phone and stuff like that. But he was like, oh that he had he has something for me, he thinks I would like it. Uh so he, when he came to Lagos, he he's based in Abuja. So he came to Lagos and he came with the um that's where like I felt like that's why I have the soft spot for Fujifilm like for the brand entirely because I feel that camera like getting this E the um what's it called the Fujifilm E X E one it literally changed like the um literally changed photography for me because I, I always say that I'm not sure I would have kept like I I, I think maybe I would have moved on to something else if I never stumbled on that camera. Like if I never I I, I just always feel it that it's something that 
there's, there's a poss possibility that Bernard will be doing photography today if maybe he didn't, he didn't ever set his hand on that camera. So, yeah, big, prop, big, big props to Fujifilm and, and, the, and the baby E, e for <laughs> Actually, at some point, we're definitely going to have a whole section where we talk about Fujifilm yeah. in its whole entirety. But before we get there, you mentioned that before you got the Fujifilm camera, you were already shooting some street photography with your phone. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So I want to, to know, like, like how, how would you describe your connection with street photography? The last time I, 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 I was... Like maybe was it a week ago or two weeks ago? I was speaking to a friend, and I said, mm -hmm. "Not a week ago, actually. It's been a while ago." And we we're talking, and when I started this photography, like doing street photography, I never had it in me. I, I never had it in my mind I was doing street photography. It was not a thing I said, "Oh, okay, now I want to start doing street photography." No, it wasn't. It wasn't something I started intentionally. It was something that I'd done it for so long. I, I had people tell me, "Oh, I, nice work, nice street photography." I'm like, "Oh, is that what it's called?" So it was in back. Um, what do you call it? Um, reverse engineering my my um my life that I, be, I began to like put the pull the pieces together to make sense of what yeah you know what I, what what I had started or what I, what I'm doing currently so um my i'll say my connection to the street would be um i think it started from my my childhood because common like I, I think it's common knowledge i was born in Osho in lagos here and I grew up in Oshu. I was I live with my mom. We moved around. We moved to um, um, Egbeda, from Egbeda, Okonla, like around the axis. Eventually, I lived in Ali Mosho as well. So um, I had like the life I had as, as a child. Like it's, I just feel like every time I grab my camera to go to go shoot, it's 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 a way. For, like I, I think it's a way for me to reconnect to something. I feel like. Um, uh, I've lost connection with or I've, I've missed uh, a huge chunk of my life I've missed so it's just a way to keep 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 that connection fresh I don't know if it makes sense yeah so mm. so it's not so that that's why I always try to explain to people that um, it's not like the goal or my my agenda or the goal for me taking these pictures is not necessarily to be that person that uh, people say oh he's a great a good photographer you know he knows the composition it's beyond all those ones are like the extras the major the, mm -hmm. the major thing or the major um plus or the major gain for me with street photography is that um connection it gives me that um it's just it's beyond the pictures that's just what i'm trying to say here mm -hmm. And I just, it's funny because I'm about to ask you because you have a quote, you have a, you have a very famous quote, you know, that says, the street is always posing, looking for whom to capture. Now, I've heard you say that quote a couple of times, right? But can you talk more about it? Like, how, how, is it, how does the street pose? So I think it came about when I was talking, trying to talk, explain to someone on, that, on how street photography can help whatever kind of, what, what other genre of photography you do. Like if say you're a wedding photographer or you're a fashion photographer or whatever it is you do, that um, the street is like a, as an awesome opportunity to practice, like to hone your craft, you get. So you know how painters have um, like their canvas, like they have their, their, their brushes and everything. The street is like an, empty, like an open canvas. So instead of you having to wait for um, wait, wait for maybe a muse like the like the portrait photographers or the um, fashion photographers would bear me witness how you need a muse you need a model you need the makeup artist like you need all these things to click before you're able to practice or to like exercise or take pictures or to create as it is with the street everything is just there like it's literally there it's abundant in nature so that's where it came about from like that whole the street is always posing like you don't you don't need you know you don't exactly need to wait for the news just go out to the street and you have everything you're waiting for yeah that's that's the uh, idea behind it yeah you should definitely copyright that quote if you can <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and so i want to ask you so in regards to street photography in your opinion, what makes a good street photograph? Hmm. You know, art is very subjective. It's unlike um, 
unlike science or maths that you just know two plus two is four, I could say this and like, but well, for somebody else, it means something else. You get, for instance, everybody goes in, we don't all vibe to the same kind of music or, well, for me, I would say, um, in your opinion, yeah, in my opinion, what I would say, uh, make the good street photograph is, first off, I, I think it should be, um, it should be what it does for you, what the picture does for you first. Yeah, so you should be the first partaker or the first, um, if if I'll use, use that word, your, your picture should be in ministration to you first before the other person or before the words. Because for me, street photography is a form of meditation. So if or when I'm out on the streets taking picture and maybe I come back home or I'm going through the photos, I should be the first partaker of the blessing. If, 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 if I should use that word, like, so if your picture isn't, if you're not, if the, if it's not doing anything to you, I think you, I think you already lost that, um, that phase of the, that phase of the, um, whatever it's called you get. So first of all, what makes a good photography is the import you get from it. Then secondly, we all know what photography is about. It's about um, the LCM, light composition moment. Great light, amazing composition, and fantastic moments. Your, your picture should have all of those if possible, yeah. But that's the that, that's the secondary aspect of it. The primary is that you should you should you should get something from the photo. Like the photo should there should be a message for you in the photo because it's like um, you know street photography is like fiction. It's not uh, you know this photojournalism where you're actually oh this is proper like not fiction. You're, you're telling the news as it is. But street photography is like your opportunity to make fiction of people's everyday life or or of um um of reality as it took in court. You get so. If by the time you finish, like not like painting, using like creating your work, and you don't, it doesn't do anything to you. Like I mean, after an artist paints something, you should feel if a, a level of satisfaction, or you should, there should be a message in it for you somehow. So if that part um, isn't there, it doesn't. I don't think no matter the level of composition or light or moments you have in the picture, I don't think like that's all those secondary parts should, wouldn't matter, wouldn't make any sense. Yeah. That's what I think. Though, yeah. Correct. Correct. Now, one thing you said that I don't want to skip over. You said LCM. I've been in photography for, I've been in photography for, for a while and I've not heard of that. <laughs> Can you talk more about LCM? For those that don't know what, um, you know, in mathematics we had HCF. Is it HCF? Highest, highest common, highest common factor. Then LCM is lowest common. Um, I, I need to brush my mathematics. <laughs> so it's not an acronym. Like, uh -huh. It's like the um, trinity of photography, like light, composition, and moment. Or some other people uh -huh. try to use mood. So. You know, without light, there's no photography because photography in, in itself is drawn with light. Then you have composition. Composition is something personally I'm very, very, um, I'm very, very, uh, something I'm very interested in. It's something I actually love. It's, it's one of the first things that like got me very, like got me connected or got me attracted to photography as a whole. So um, composition is key because it's a way you, it's how you frame your story, how like, from seeming chaos, you can literally compose or make a story of chaos. That's that's something you do through composition. Then moments is where, um, how we say it is, uh, the reason why blogs will always have traffic is because when they say um, there's fire somewhere, it's always with, a, with his or her phone making a video of it. And it, and um, Linda Kid gets it, for instance. Um, free free promotes Linda Kid. <laughs> so I should put it on <laughs> Uh, or Lori Super Girl, for instance, puts it. Uh, they put it on their blog. Mm -hmm. What make what what keeps people glued to? Or what keeps anybody glued to that post or to the blog or whatever it is? Is the moment you get. So it's the fact that oh, there's actually something happening. Like they can they can see the fire burning. But you as a professional, if you if your light is great, if your composition is great, and you miss out on the moment, it doesn't make any sense. Like you just end up creating. Beautiful nonsense. I don't know if that makes sense. 
So beautiful nonsense. So in all your getting, you need to get moments. That that's yes. the, that's the whole um, the the summer of the gist. <laughs> So you guys, if you're not taking notes, I don't know what's, what's wrong with you. Take notes, please. Okay, so let's go back to street photography for a minute. Yeah. So for someone that wants to get into street photography, what's the right way to approach a stranger that you want to photograph? The right way to approach a stranger. So there's there different kinds of... Um, um, Different approaches for different kinds of street photography. Uh, I know you. I know we know. Um, you know. You, do you know Mayo too, for instance? Yes, we know him very, very well. Okay, yeah, Mayo is a great guy, amazing guy. He loves to do portraits of people on the streets. Uh, my my approach is a bit different because I actually like the imposed. Um, what we call the imposed. Um, the imposed fragments of the street, like. I'm not. I'm not one that's so concerned about like getting portraits of people. So when you have to, when maybe your your style or your preference is getting portraits of people, it's it's expected or is required for you to first off don't be a creep. Like don't be creepy about it because that I feel that's what gets people in trouble. So you have someone with a camera hiding the camera, like you're trying to get someone's portrait and you're being sneaky about it. Then you, all of a sudden you 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 more like pose a threat to the person because the person is really weary, like, what's this guy trying to do about do to me? Well, if you're up front, you, like, when I, when, whenever I'm going out, like, I know I'm going to take pictures. I always have my camera right in front of me. I always have it hung on my shoulder or right in the place where people see them. So, already, I'm, like, I'm not, I'm already, I'm, I'm already in your face. Then you see my camera. Then if I, at all, I'm maybe attracted to, I, I take portraits sometimes. Maybe I see a feature on the face or the hairstyle, something that's really interesting. I walk up to the person and introduce myself. Hi, my name is Ben Carlo. Oh, you look good. Always give compliments. You, you look nice. Can I take a picture? Usually, like, over 70% of the time, they, they will oblige you. But in the case, they say, no, just move on. I mean, in Lagos, you have up to 20 million people. So that's just one person out of 20 million people you get. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, out of that 30%, do you ever get uh, the area boy that uh, brought <laughs> how do you how do you handle those situations? Um, <laughs> this question is, I think, is the most asked question <laughs> ever for, for people that are in taking pictures on the street. So um, definitely, you get confrontations, but you don't like. I don't mm -hmm. think I've ever been in in any um, confrontation that literally got um, got out of hand. Like first off, because my um, my, my reason or my agenda for going out to the street to take pictures is not to harm anybody. So because I already know in my mind that I'm not, I'm not constituting a nuisance to anyone, I'm not about to steal from anybody. So that state of mind, that mindset already puts me, like I already have the mindset. So I'm not, I'm not um, there's no fear you get. I, there's no fear, but definitely I'm, I'm always scanning my environment because I mean, there are people that can be silly or something like that. But because I'm going to the street with no fear, I don't, I don't expect that someone come to me and fight me. So, but in a case where someone comes up to me and be like, "Oh, what are you doing there?" I'll be like, "I'll just smile to the person." And be like, how far? How does it concern you? Get versus like, "Hey, what, are you snapping me?" I'll be like, "Oh, it depends." If I see, if, it just depends on the mood. I could be like, "Oh, oh, you want me to? You want me to snap you? Would you pay?" Just make conversation at the end of this because these people are human beings. You need to. Um, there's something someone said that was really beautiful. I think I read it, it was it two days ago. He said, um, as much as possible, I, I want to be perceived as a person, not a photographer. So when you always, you're always conscious or, um, yeah, conscious of the fact that first off, you need to be a person, like be a person, be, a, be human enough to them. Don't, don't let your, your skill or your photography go beyond, go first before, your personality. Your personality should come first before your skill, before your photography. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like something that Maya would say. He said he would say, "Be a human being first, then yeah. a photographer." Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. And so, when you first started photography, did you at any time like shoot from the hip, or was your camera always up high? Oh no! Like, like how? How was it? <laughs> 
funny enough, I still shoot from the hip actually because most times when people get conscious of your, uh, like when they get conscious of your camera, you might lose the moment you're going for. For instance, okay, there was a time when um, I was walking somewhere around Odota and um, um, this area, area boy, oh, you see, area, should I call him area boy now? I think he, one of these guys that work for um, the park guys, so he was he was making trouble, like he was fighting with one of the drivers, and the driver was on the steering. They were right on the road <laughs> where things are happening, Lagos, and they were like they were exchanging words, and the guy brought out uh, the guy that was outside the bus, that's the guy that was for the park guys, brought out a bottle of water and literally says flashing on the driver. I had my camera right in front of me. I just, I just like put it on a shot. If I had raised it up, they would have gotten conscious, maybe stop or someone's trying to cover me. So there are, there are pictures you might miss when the camera is, camera is on your, like when you're trying to raise it to your, to your face. So the reason why I shoot at the hip sometimes is just so that I get um, moments, like on post moments, so that I don't miss the moment because sometimes, or well, there are still, all the times when I literally have to move the cameras to my face to get better pictures, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, as, as we're saying shoot to the hip, some people might not even know what shoot to the hip, sh- shooting from the hip means. Could you kind of just do like a, a brief explanation of what shooting from the hip is? It's, it's, At least. it's the literal thing, literally having your camera and shooting from the hip, basically. So, <laughs> you know how, um, it's more, um, there's something... Was it Tom Sutter that, that was calling it? It was, uh, what's that word? I think he said, um, I remember. But basically, shooting from the hip is when you, when you get your camera and um, instead of shooting from the eye, you like, you like, you hide or keep your camera bring it down to your waist level, your stomach level, and just shoot from there, yeah. Um, the X Pro 3 makes that easy because the, the screen flips out the other way, yeah. That's just extra talk. And so we've heard some of the advantages, but what are some of the disadvantages of shooting from the hip? The major disadvantage is that you miss many, many shots because it's you're spr- you're more like spraying. It's like you're just you're uh, you're just throwing stones, hoping something hits. You get so let's you you could end up making say a um, hundred frames and maybe. Or 100 might be a stretch. Let's say you might end up getting, say, 20 frames of like shooting from the hip, and you might not have one picture in all those frames. So there's no, like, there's no, um, you know, there's no, what's it called now? What's the word? You're not being, um, I'm trying to remember the word. When you're, there's no, ah, help me, English, is English my first language? <laughs> so you know, you know when you're shooting from the eye, you 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 know what you're doing. You're being um, what's that thing? It's just in my forehead here. Yeah. You're being present. Not present. I, I, I'm not. Oh, can we? I've not been seen. I was wondering why my, my phone was intentional. Thank you, Ebon. God bless you. But I was wondering why nobody was seeing me. I wasn't seeing anything on my phone. Apparently, it was cold. Though. Yeah, you're not being intentional. Ebon got it. So, mm-hmm. it helped. Like, when you have your phone to you, or you're being intentional about what, you, what you're shooting, like, you can, like, you can frame properly. You can, you get, you know what you're looking for. You know what you're shooting from. But when you're shooting from the hill, you're just spraying, literally. You're just spraying and spraying that one, 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 one thing works. Yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. And so when you come home and, and you don't see any shot, it's just like, well, go, I guess I go tomorrow. You go the game, yeah. <laughs> you keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> and so, question. While you're out shooting, yeah. do you keep your camera on, like, a certain mode, like, aperture priority? Mm-hmm. Or how do you you set anything before you shoot? Uh, or do you use manual manual mode? So, I I don't shoot. I don't do aperture priority or any. I, I just shoot the major manual mode. But it depends on what I'm doing. So I recently got um, a what's it called a manual lens, and I was just, like 
experimenting. Like, it's time to get a man, mono 35 artisan, TT artisan lens. So when, whenever I'm shooting on that lens, I just have, just set my camera to, um, um, I do zone focus, zone focusing where you just, well, more like put your, I put my setting on maybe F8 to F11, have a fixed um, shutter, shutter speed and uh, aperture. No, aperture is F8, um, shutter speed and what ISO, for instance. So when I'm out, I just know, uh, I already know the distance that I'll, I'll get focus in. So if there's something I'm trying to create, I'm not, I'm, I'm never trying to fiddle with my settings anymore. I just know that, oh, this is the distance I'll be able to get um, that um, action or subject in, in focus. So I just use my distance. But when I'm shooting with my, uh, my X100V, I, I still use manual mode. I, I already do aperture priority here. Yeah. Because it's not difficult to actually fiddle with my settings. So if maybe it was difficult to get to my I mean, the settings are all on my camera, so I can easily just move it to whatever I want. But if maybe that was, if it was difficult to do that, maybe I would um, opt for the aperture priority. And yeah, I hear it's, it's like yeah, the aperture priority, it's but I don't do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I guess you've been doing it for a while, so you can probably catch a moment real fast, set your camera. But the mm -hmm. average person is like, ah, what am I doing? And so they want to, so, so they put their um, camera in a certain settings. But I guess it's per individual. What you, yeah, yeah, yeah. What you yeah like. That's that's why I have a big challenge with. Um, so there are a lot of things many of us try to make laws or make uh, new doctrines out of that are not necessary. Are not really necessary because at the end of the day, what's what's most important is. You, the work you create, you create. Because there was a time when people would be like, "Oh, when they see you with a small camera, they're like, oh, that one is not serious now. What, I, what is he using? You need to have like, oh, when you don't, you have proper big cameras like the DSLRs. You're considered serious." But now that whole phase has gone. Like people now realize that oh, you have smaller cameras that are doing crazy work. So as much as possible, it's I think it's not it's it's really not helpful to dwell on all those um, smaller things like. There are other conversations to be had. Like, I mean, you, you can people can discuss other things aside just um, dwelling on how do you, how do you, how do you. Those are the simpler, simpler things. Yeah. Even if, like the big thing with photography is like also like you can know the quote unquote rules, but you should break them. Don't nothing is set in stone. Yeah, but you need to know the rules to break them. That's the because. People, yeah. There was a time someone shared a picture with me. Um, a picture was, uh, I don't want to use horrible, but it was actually off. And and I didn't want to like, I like, I mean, you always gauge people. Like you, there are people you know that you can be candid with. You can like open up and say, "Oh, dude, this is not great." You can, but there are people you just have to like. You know how to you maybe have to watch how you communicate with them. You have to. It, Deep your and I was trying to like oh be maybe be diplomatic say oh, oh I, I wish you did this or you didn't do this and the person went oh you know I'm just trying to break the rules I'm like um, okay I think you need to know the rules first because what makes I mean it's it's boredom to break the rules like people that break the rules out of boredom when you when you've done the rules so far maybe you just want to experiment then you decide to break the rules not when you don't know the rules at all you just start out and say oh now I want to break the rules come on what rules are you breaking do you know the rules you're breaking Yet, yeah, <laughs> I like that. Do you know the rules that you're breaking? Yeah. Makes sense, makes sense. Now, apart from being a street photographer, you're also a documentary photographer. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to know, like, what's the major difference between street photography and documentary photography? Um, so, you know, we talked about fiction and non-fiction. Mm -hmm. Good photography is fiction, like, because it's literally, it's almost make-believe. Like, you can, um, you can, like, when, when, when I'm on the street, I mean, if you, there are a lot of street photography um, Instagram accounts where you see people, like, do very interesting things where they just oppose um, signs on the street with people's heads. Like, it's just... There's that part of uh, street photography that is highly fiction. Then documentary is um, it's when you when there's like an objective. For instance, um, when there's something you're trying to say, like uh, 
when, when there's a story that that's, that you're trying to tell, for instance, when you talk about um, there's a story I did um, recently on um, not so recent, the one I did on uh, for instance, the one I'm doing currently on suits, the suit issue in Port Harcourt. I mean, there's a challenge there. You, you, you're doing research. You're asking questions. It's not just you going out to just shoot. There's more into, like there's a different kind of intentionality with that because you're not just trying to create for art. You're actually documenting things for research purposes. For like to have a like have a uh, what's it called a like to create a document picture in, in this sense but like a document to show or to say oh this is this is what I'm, I'm trying to shed light on this I'm trying to like add my voice to this issue it's issue based like that's a documentary is issue based why street is very free freestyle yeah mm, documentary is issue based yeah so street photography is like as you see it, it's, it's, yeah, it's freestyle rather, yeah. Mostly freestyle. Mm -hmm. But there's also something that happens when um, there's a, a woman in the UK, her name is Heidi. She's been, um, she, she, she's, she's elderly, she's, I think she's above 60. So she's been doing street photography for, for years, like for decades, like, so she uh, stumbled, she found like um, films, I think she found like old films of her previous work. So her own form of street photography is, was, is not the extreme kind of street photography where we're just trying to do like crazy things, maybe merge someone's head to like all those just opposition. No, it's just literally just capturing daily, everyday life of people back then. I think in stock, um, Stockport, I'm not sure where in the UK, but somewhere in the UK. So what she did is she, she has a series of pictures she's been creating every other like day in the 60s and the 70s of people in her neighborhood, just random pictures of everyday life. Maybe someone in, in front of a shop selling flowers, some some woman walking a child, like just random pictures. So what, she found those, uh, those films and developed the pictures and decided to create a book of those street images. So that now becomes like a project, like it's borderline a documentary project because it's literally everyday life of people back then. So it can literally be used as a document to compare our life then and life now. So that's where almost where the line is almost blurred, where street photography becomes like documentary, you get. Because at the end of the day, we are all documentary photographers. Yeah. Actually, I was about to ask you that question. Like, I'm about to say that regardless of the genre of your of photography, yeah. we're all technically documentary photographers yeah. at the end of the day. And some people would say that maybe street photography is almost, could be a category of documentary photography. Would Is that possible? Would you yeah, say yeah, yes, no? Even, or, or, even, even student portraits, is a, student portraits are... <laughs> form of documentary because I mean we, this this uh, um I don't know if you know uh, tell the story it's run by yes Wally yes yeah. so um there was a time he invited me to Benin um I I saw the work of one an old photographer I think the Alonge is his name so he, what he used to do back then he used to do studio portraits literally just you know how like I'm not sure you I don't are you Gen Z or which one are you are you millennial or Gen Z. <laughs> Millennial, oh, millennial, millennial. So you should know. You know how back then you have you, you go to studios, you have backdrop, uh, you have people come come and pose on Sunday, like just take studio part. They they phased <laughs> off that 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 time, but you know that's what he used to do. But mostly black and white pictures. People come on Sundays or during events, they come to his studio. Uh, he, there's maybe a chair there or like just different portraits or someone like when people are like they feel like they're dressed good or it's a, maybe their birthday, whatever it is, they just come to take portraits. So apparently they just they, they found his work as well. Like they made like um, a book from his work and I think an exhibition. So imagine someone that was just doing studio studio portraits where some people consider the average like portrait photographer of, of his day. His work has now put together, curated and collected to be a form of documentary. So at the end of the day, we are documentary photographers. And I think it's something we should have, we should be conscious of because we have a lot of people that are just shooting for the money like, Oh, like oh, I need to I need to eat. I need to put food on my table. Or oh, where's the next client coming from? Birthday portrait. That, that. But if I think if we have that mindset that our work will would outlive us, or you, or at least have the hope 
that what we would at least was at least it, it will uh too much English. <laughs> but I feel if we have that hope or we're conscious of the fact that the work would, would at least outlive us, it will it will affect the way we go about it. We don't like would be more there's a level of intentionality that would would work with, yeah. Thank you, Ebun, for bringing that word back to me <laughs> because I, can't, I almost, almost yeah, forgot it. Yes. <laughs> now, this is kind of random, but so as you said, like work outliving you, right? Yeah. Now, a lot of times we want the credit for your work, right? Does that mean we should make sure our watermark is there clearly in the corner so we get the credits? It's because how will someone know that it's you that shot it in 3020? <laughs> how, how will you know? So, if you like, uh, put your watermark over, like, it should cover the whole photo. Someone that is very good on Photoshop, it takes him less than 10 minutes to put it down. So, I don't think the concept of using a watermark or trying to be known by your watermark helps because uh, what we found out is that it actually stops or covers your work and people are not able to take in the the complete image of the beauty of your work, you're distracted. You know, as much as possible, you know, we tell people when you shoot or oh, avoid distractions. Then imagine you shoot nice picture, you now decide to by yourself put a full distraction on your work. What do you want people to consume? So, and now you, this is the era of metadata where, metadata where, I mean, as long as you have your metadata on the picture, no matter where it's used, you do, as long as you search Google, Put your name there. As long as you have it on the picture, the picture will pop up. It doesn't. No matter where, as long as the picture is on the internet, you find it. So, what's now the essence of trying to put your watermark? I think the idea of putting your watermark um, where it used to, where the conversation used to hold was when people were trying to do it to for customer sake, to to like drive traffic to for their business. I think if you decide to do, still do it that way, maybe you shouldn't make it that. You shouldn't make it so big. You can just maybe put like a little. Initial. I mean, if you're that good, people will try to look for you to look for where, what the initial means. But the concept of covering your whole work, I don't think it's. I don't think it's, um, it's advised. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, because that, that's actually a topic that we can talk on forever. <laughs> but but let's go back to documentary photography. Yeah. So it's like this: Who is Andrew Asable, and what role did he play in your documentary photography career? Uh, Andrew is an OG. Is that that the Andrew, even though he's the coolest of all people, he doesn't he doesn't grow like that? That whole that be uncle, but he's amazing. I think he's he's one of um, he's one of the great people I've been opportune to meet on this journey, and there are, there are a number of them. But he he stands out because um, there was a time I had. Um, uh, there was a Nat Geo portfolio review. review in Lagos, 2017. And, oh, and like at the time, even to now, I'm very adverse to applying for stuff. My wife is trying to help me. <laughs> but I am very like, you know, when it is like a call to apply, I'm just always very, because uh, it just feels like, uh, it just feels like you're trying to get validation for your work. And it can be very, I mean, it can be very um, uncomfortable when you're just waiting for someone to say you're doing, you're doing, you, you did well or you didn't do well. Or when people literally have to certify, start maybe determine whether you deserve something or you don't deserve something. So it can feel very, um, Uncomfortable. I think I should leave it at uncomfortable. So, <laughs> but at the time there was that um, um, portfolio review, and um, <laughs> and my friend Chris Honor, my very good friend, biggest Chris, he was like, "Oh, that, oh, I think you should. I think you should submit your work. I mean, you have some good." And at the time, me, I mean, I don't. I, then I was just in street photography, so I didn't really. I wasn't thinking about documentary as it is, like because. For documentary project, there's a way you present it. Like it's the presentation is different. Like there are things you need to understand. I mean, I, this this the level of research that should go into the work and all all that stuff. But at the time, I just thought I just had good pictures. I thought were were nice and they were good. So I just put them together, put them on the what's it called, uh, like on a dock. Um, just added some a few words of pictures, streets of Lagos, blah 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 blah. I submitted and. Um, we were, we were two, um, about your me, Anthony, won it that year, but it was, so it was two of us, I was like first runner up and, 
and he was announced. So Andrew, like Andrew, was one of the judges. And after that, day, he reached out to me. He was like, "Oh, that dude, you have, your, your work is great, boy." You know, like he was just literally trying to encourage me because I mean, imagine someone that didn't like to apply for stuff. He applies, and it would be better if maybe I never made like my work was literally thrown out of the window from in the first stage and having to get so close and to not be pushed out to get. So he, was, he encouraged me. We had he, he um, we had we had some calls. We had a couple of calls, and I mean. And I, he was so like he's still so busy. I mean, he was so busy at that time, but he made time. Like we had a call. He was like, um, "Bennett, this that that that." Da. He was even the one that talked about. Um, it was from him. I call, like I made sense of that whole moment thing. That oh, Bennett, you shoot a lot of beautiful photos, but you know it's more than beautiful pictures. Your picture you should have like a, there should be a motive. There should be um, there should be moment. There should be moments there. What are you trying to say? Like all those kind of questions. I mean, he legit opened my mind into um this other kind of photography like documentary photography and and, and then we, we got to then 2019 as well uh, when i attended the um, um seven academy workshop in rwanda he was my tutor as well i fell into his class so it was just beautiful amazing coincidence <laughs> the first time if the first time was on the second time, second time was a coincidence <laughs> Yeah. Oh, wow, 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 wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to like say backstory of how impactful he's been in my in my career. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. essentially, he's he's, def he's definitely one of your mentors. Yeah, you said that. Yeah, he's yeah, one of my mentors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, a mentor that you stumbled across. Not you were looking for him. It just came into your life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. Just nail. <laughs> makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. And so. You're speaking about the Nat Geo portfolio review. I was going to get to that. Now, for a photographer that wants to do a portfolio review, what are some things that they can do to get the best out of that experience? Okay, so a photographer is trying to apply for a portfolio review. Yeah, so what things should they do to make sure maybe they win or, or they get a <laughs> I, I, think, I think it's, it's great. important to manage your expectations because the goal of winning might not be what you need. Your 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 goal, your goal should be to come out of it better. I mean, I didn't necessarily win that opportunity, but I came out of it better thanks to I mean Andrea and, and all the people at the time that that reached out. You get so I I learned I. I mean, I, 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 I'm still at it. I still create work, and I, you get so it could have gone either way. What if at that time, after that stuff, I just packed my camera and brought a file and went to look for a job somewhere? You get so. So I think the goal should be to necessarily win, whether it's money, whether it's money rather, or mm -hmm. it should be to have your work checked. Have have like yeah, there's something someone says that it doesn't matter how fast you're going if you're going in the wrong direction. You get so. So it's 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 it should be about uh, it should be more uh, you should anticipate the idea of being put like being corrected like being put in the right route for yourself or for, for your journey or for your career you get so it's not necessarily about winning whatever whether it's uh, uh, an opportunity or money it should be a, what you should look out for most importantly is the fact that you meet um, people I believe that are more experienced than you are to critique your work and shed light on your blind spots and advise you generally mm -hmm. make make you the best like better artist for you for yourself not necessarily about whether you you know beat any other people we are not athletes of course <laughs> of course so i was more referring to maybe like tips maybe a work that work that you don't consider strong in, in your portfolio maybe you should remove it before you go to the view mm -hmm. things more things and more of that yeah so lane. There's something we, there's something I, I learned years ago on the weakest link, on how in a body of work your your whole work is as strong as your weakest photo. You get so if no matter how much sentiment how much sentiment you have for a picture or how lovely you think a picture is, if it doesn't work for that sequence for that story, I think you should kill it because it might end up killing your chances. You get so it's it, it's tough love, but it's just something you have. So, may, as I would, what our advice is, you we should first have peer mentors before you like you should have friends 
And that's why I like the community now. They love like photographers that it was, it was the same in my own like my like it's still the same, even though everybody's busy now. I mean, we used to be very like it was very easy to reach out to each other. Um there was a Diolu, there's Dami at the time, like when you have like work, this trees, like when I have work that um I'm like I'm not I'm not so sure about I can put a call to Chris and say, Oh, big Chris this work and he's like oh i like this picture mm, this picture i'm not so sure about it the same with him as well like just bounce off ideas so before you take your work out look for yeah, let it go like show your click or people that you respect among your amongst your peers let them look at it for you first and they might help like point out one or two things before you now go outside but i know a lot of people have concerns people are always like oh someone will copy my work so i'm like see nobody's copying your work like you need to rest, you need to come out of your of your bubble because this whole this world is so big. Like for you to be holding something that you shot in one village somewhere, to be thinking someone's trying to steal your idea. No, like you it's I think it's that whole um that whole scarcity shortage mentality that, that keeps one in that place. You need to open up open your mind and be more abundant conscious. It should be more about you getting better, not you holding the little that you think you have, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Actually, with that, could you maybe ex- expand on that? Because I think photographers, maybe a mindset changes, definitely. Hmm. I, I think I said that. Like, I'm not sure what to say anymore, but <laughs> like before you head out, before like you ask or oh, what steps would be nice to take if you're looking to apply for uh, attend or um, be part of um, portfolio, portfolio, like get into portfolio. It's really important for everybody's career. Like personally, I still do portfolio reviews. Like there are people I still reach out to, to say, oh, I did this work. Um, like what do you like? I mean, everybody should. Every artist should have um, checks, should have, it might, not, it might not be one person, it might be a couple of people, it might be, or you might just decide to even leave the work for a while, look at it now, you get like, okay, for instance, there was a work I, I did for, um, um, for a residency I, I did this year, there was like a, um, a, a story I, I did, like it's something I started years ago, like, well, how I shot it was different. So I, I said oh, I was going to further it in the residency. And I called a couple of people. I, I, I spoke with lots of people. I spoke with um, this lady called Dola Porsche. We spoke. I spoke to a, a number of people. And I, like, I got ideas from everybody, like dropped minds and created the work. Even after I was done creating the work, I still had to like have a couple of calls. Uh, before even I started calling them, I, I created the work, left it for a while. Um, went back to it after maybe a week or two, came back, I saw some things I did, I missed out on first, but brought them down. I just kept pruning until I felt it was ready enough to um, like put in to say, oh, this is ready. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. And did you do that? Um, basically, did you do a peer-to-peer review before you did, before you entered the Nat Geo Portfolio, portfolio. No, I, I didn't do it at the time. I didn't do it at the time. I mean, okay. I, it was my first, I think that was my actual first time of trying to uh, get a portfolio review or something. Yeah. The only pair to pair review I've done was, I mean, my friend Chris I, I, that I was with at the time. Mm-hmm. He, he, I mean, he told me all oh, these pictures were great, but I mean, we're both limited at the time. So we now went there and they bashed us. <laughs> 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 but coming uh, first one up, like for your first one ever, that's like the type of motivation behind that is like yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's good? And so you mentioned being like how um I guess you completed your arts res- res- residency <laughs> this year, right? English is not a first language. It's fine. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I'm learning. <laughs> and and so I believe you did it with Onka O O O N C A. How do you say it? Onka? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, and so for those listening or watching that don't know what an arts resi- resi- residency is, can you please explain what it is? <sighs> so um, basically, an art residency is um, like an opportunity you get from um, 
an ads incubator and or, or an ad space. They uh, they usually have open calls. They would say, "Oh, we're looking for artists to apply for, looking for artists that would apply for a residency. Um, we want an artist that will create work." They, they usually have like a team for um, an idea. They, they would prefer or they would like the artist to work around. So if it's something that you you'd apply, and it's usually funded, meaning. The, the pay for um, for the like if it's say a month's residency it depends on the like whatever arrangement you have with them but usually it's funded so they literally just pay you to have you create yeah so you get a you, you're maybe in their space or whatever the arrangement is you you create the work you have time to research like it's it's like a way to get you out of your normal, your regular world to a different uh, place that would help your focus. It will help you focus and help mm-hmm. your focus in, in, in literally like to um, literally have you focus on the work you're doing here, yeah. on the work you, you'd like to create here. Yeah. Now, when you say apply to, I guess, get to get accepted for an art residency, do you have to be a certain caliber of photographer, or can anyone apply it? Get up, get up. So that's one thing too I used to think. Something Andrew told me, I always repeat anytime I have the chance. He always says, your work is your weapon. You are not like all these things. When, we, when, when you even think about artists or photographers that, that are respected, they're not, they're not respected so much for any other thing apart from the work they've done. So first off, don't think there's something like this, any other thing that qualifies you apart from the work. If As long as you keep doing the work, your value keeps rising. Don't listen to the noise. If you keep doing the work, your value keeps rising. So like, you get accepted if you, for instance, most of them, they will ask, so if say they say they want to work around, um, around climate, um, climate change, and if you've done any project at all around that climate change, maybe climate change or something related, you can share a link to it or put some pictures just to show that, oh, this is, like, I'm interested in doing this kind of thing. I'm interested in for, like furthering this project that I already started and these are examples of what I've done already. You get, so your value is in the work you've made, not in what, any other thing. Leave the noise, do the work. This episode is sponsored by Bush Digital. Most likely, you've spent thousands on your camera. So why not protect it with a silicone case for a limited time only? When you send the code NPH cases to Bush underscore digital on Instagram, you'll get a 20% discount plus free delivery to any state in Nigeria when you purchase a silicone case. And so another thing is that, so you did your own in the UK, I believe. Yeah. Right? And so did they fly you out? Did you go there? How, how did that, how that process work? So everything depends. Like, my, like my, um, you, some, some of them, the, um, the whole arrangement can cover your flights, your accommodation, your, like just your, everything you need to just get you focused on the work. Yeah. So wherever you are in Nigeria, you're free to apply. To I, our I, know, I know, I know, um, what's it called? Um, what's this place? Uh, uh, yeah. oh my God. I hope I'll be forgiving the way I'm trying to remember this thing. <laughs> no problem. I'll, I'll remember the place. But I mean, the, even even spaces, art spaces here in Nigeria and Lagos, they offer residences. Yeah. yeah it doesn't have to be, like, residency opportunities are around, like, even around the continent. There's one I applied for that I, I, I didn't get in. That one was in Senegal, in Dakar. So, yeah, residency opportunities are around, yeah. But... No, but because... Um, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but the thing is... You know, the goal is to get you to a place where you can, like, f- now focus on the work. But you should at least be doing the work already. Like, even in your in your busy schedule as it is, get all the, uh, yeah, everyone uh, will help with all, like, their various opportunities. So even 
in your day-to-day opportunity. Get, find time, make time to create work bef- so that you can have at least something to show that, okay, this is what I'm trying to um, build on. Then someone can now decide to, like, literally pay you to get you to focus on on the project or, or do, doing the rest of the work. Or at least have the idea here. Basically, we want to emphasize because you know some people, by their own mindset, they will limit they'll limit they'll limit themselves just to their states. But there's opportunities outside of Nigeria that you can take advantage of. Yeah, if you need you need to, or you go to Lagos, wherever you need to go. <laughs> and essentially, let's talk about one of your favorite topics. You know, Fuji Fuji fit, right? <laughs> now, being in being the only Fuji film ambassador or a, a Fuji X photographer in Nigeria, what what benefits come with it? Do you get free cameras? Do they pay you hundreds of thousands of dollars? So, what are the benefits? So I should say that Fuji's um, Fuji's um, system or Fuji's Fuji's design is not it's not it's not an influencer arrangement. It's it's more like people that, like people that become ex photographers. They don't become ex photographers because the the it's not it's not an influencer arrangement. It's not because oh uh, Fuji things or oh, like they think oh you have so many followers or oh, you're this you're that. It's by you have to first of love the brand, like the brand. So it's like a testament arrangement. Like or oh, actually like you have to care about the brand on its own. Like, like you have to have like a personal um, testimony, more like. <laughs> yeah. It's like, a lot of people, when they just hear the ambassador, you just think, oh, it's just something where, oh, maybe every month you get payment. And definitely there are perks with, that come with it. Maybe I get I get some discount when I have to buy gears. And uh, I, I, like, I get the opportunity to, to maybe shoot um, videos for the brand. Those don't come to come with this payment, but generally it's not an influencer arrangement. It's something that works. Like general, Fuji, Fuji X photographers are photographers that use the brand, use the brand, have been, like have used the brand for a while, and they and they like, they actually love their gear and they love photography as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The reason why we have this question is because it's like this: What steps can photographers take? If they want to be an official ambassador to brands like Fujifilm, Canon, Nikon, what steps should they take? Should they, should they maybe send an email to the communications manager, or does the opportunity come eventually? Hopefully. Yes. So um, it depends. They, I'm not sure how other brands work, or for Fuji, you can um, you can reach out to like. I mean, people send emails, send DMs, and it, they could, like, if they maybe go through your work, they're interested, they can, like, oh, reach out to you and say, okay, fine, this makes sense. But it's not, um, I don't know, I just always try to explain that it's not an influencer arrangement, <laughs> like a normal, average influencer arrangement, like we understand it in Vegas here. When you have people enhancing products or goods they don't use. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not <laughs> break any tables. <laughs> oh, but, oh, but, uh, now, now, with that, did they come to you or did you go to them? Like, how did that work? Okay, so um, hmm, it's a long story. The, uh, so basically, it was... I did start. It was um, thanks to my wife. So uh, it, it started when... She, she she met like a Fuji ex photographer abroad, and like oh, she was oh my husband's a photographer, and um, he saw my work, and he was like oh like how like the conversation came up oh like more like the what's it called the conversation happened that way and oh um, I think I should connect you to like what well, started from that conversation from my work. so it was connection yeah kind of yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you know. I can imagine some people watching, like, okay, Nigeria. The only way to do it is by connection. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I don't even know how to put it, but yeah, that's how it happened. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. But at the end, of the day, and so when it, if like anything can start off like can 
can spark off something, but it has to be um, uh, what's it called? There has to be like something that that makes it whole. You get so if maybe at the end of the day conversation happened and maybe the person saw the pictures and didn't think oh the pictures were okay or didn't think or oh, like there was anything there that the conversation could have died there. You, you get so so yeah. Mm-hmm. And so did you did you ever feel like when you finally became an ambassador? Did you feel like it was destined to happen? Like you're already doing your thing, and then for you to come. For them to come through, it was like, wow, okay. But were you surprised? Were you in shock? It wasn't shock per se, but I felt, I felt, um, I felt really good about it because, I mean, when we started the, the, the call, I told you about how, um, how the XE1, what it was, like what it did to my photography, how it literally helped re, re-engineered or reshaped the way I work or my my goals about photography in the first place. Because I mean, I started thinking, I started photography thinking I'm trying to make money and trying to make a living rather uh, as doing events and all. But when I got um, the XC1, like it was it was something else. I just started looking at looking for something else to photograph. I don't know if you understand. So it, it felt good to like for a camera that I, I, I felt that much attachment to. It felt good to. Um, it felt good that it happened that oh years later that this same brand said to oh thought I, I was good enough to be an ex photographer yeah so I, this the, the uh, fulfillment that I had or I have um, as a result of that um, whole connection happening. Mm-hmm. Now time for your favorite parts. Let let's run a Fujifilm camera ad right real quick. So how did getting a Fujifilm camera as a photographer? Hmm. <laughs> so first of all, Romo, the difference between DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, like there's a big, there's a huge um, gap. Um, it's not enough for a camera to, like way for, way for the film is Excel is the fact that it's not just about the camera being able to take pictures. It's about you wanting to use your camera. Like that's, that um, that that willingness, that joy to want to pick your camera because it doesn't matter. It, like I mean, no matter how beautiful a pen is, it's until you write with it that you that you eventually make sense or know how to write. You get so it's not enough to just have a camera that you just always pick up only when you have work, but to have a camera that you actually just want to create with it. That's how you get better. You learn to you, get, you learn to shoot or you learn to shoot better by shooting. You get so. That's what it did for me. For film, like that's like I explained, the, all the cameras I've been able to use from the brand, like there's that the ease and the the, the, the smoothness. In fact, I mean, imagine having a a um, a modern a modern <laughs> modern camera in an in an old fashioned body. You know that whole like it's it's just, just something about it. You know, people, most people when you ask them, they they always like oh, Fuji film has soul. So it's that soul we're talking about here. Yeah. Fuji film has soul. There's not just so do other yeah. <laughs> I'm like, do other brands have soul or is this just Fuji film? <laughs> I, I wouldn't know about other brands. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure, 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 sure. Now let's switch it up a bit, right? So we talked about like your art residency, your art residency, um, time and different time and experiences. So I want to keep on the topic of art, right? So what? Are your thoughts on art being seen as content these days? It's a sad, but it's the um, oh, I should say it's a, it's a sad reality we find we find ourselves in now. When uh, literally, where art is called content. Um, what do I think about it? So I. I generally don't like talking about it because I feel it's, I'm hoping it's just a phase. I'm hoping it's just a phase because I mean, there's, it, it was, a, I mean, it's been a long time coming. Like, there's the, like, we, there's a time when the world, there's a time when the world became like very fast. Like you had fast cars, fast food, fast everything. So even now you're not have like fast fast art as it is so and instagram like instagram is one of the like i mean it's one of the culprits in this in this issue where 
where um, there's now so much work, there's so much art in like available in very like in microseconds you get. So it's something I usually don't like talking about, but I'm hoping it's a phase. But another thing is depending on where you where where whatever um, wherever you 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 you, you lean to if you lean towards if you prefer the content aspect of it or you prefer the art whatever part you lean on to just hold on, hold, hold fast but me I'd rather i rather the art than the content here yeah. so in your opinion what can be done to differentiate art from just another piece of content hmm So um, when, you know, when I started talking, I spoke about um, how the first gain from your street work, how you asked how, how do you, how do you know that your work is, or oh, street photography, how do you know a picture is great, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, the first benefactor should be you. So if, for me, I think if from creating work, you... <laughs> You like you don't even have you don't even have enough time to take in the work before it's pushed out as content and you're looking to create the next one. And if you are in that loop, I, I, I mean, there's something missing. There's something off. So as much as possible, I think everybody. Like, I think we need time to um, to process stuff. You get to uh, to to take in things because if you won't get into that loop of oh, it's just all about content, about our content. There's, there's just something that happens. Like there's a there's a void that it creates. Like you just there's this gap that just just it, it, like just comes out of it here. That you, that it's not beneficial to to to, to other creatives here. Can printing out your work help with that? Okay, this is art. So like, would that can that help? But no way. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, it will help, I guess. Um, and yeah, it will help because thinking about it now, I realized that buying photo photo books, like books of like photographers' books, like photo books of, of artists, I, I think it's a way I um, some of the ways I slow down because I mean. Instagram is, is packed. I mean, it's very, I mean, you're, you're looking at picture now before you know, you're looking at the advertising another thing for you. So uh, one, one of the ways I try to like, when I really want to like um, taking pictures and like be in that zone, photo book helps. Like, so maybe printing your work to helps. And something I'm considering, like I'm working on trying to like at least create my first um, commercial photo book, even though it would be, uh, in limited edition, yeah. When it comes out, we'll, we'll definitely help you uh, push it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so one thing, so to, like still on your views, right? In a previous interview, you said that as a photographer, try to separate the value of your work from what? Can you talk more about that statement? So when the world where capital capitalism is capitalizing, <laughs> it's a joke I have mm -hmm. around with my wife. So um I mean it's it's almost difficult not to not to get into that loop of like of that, that money, like that money loop where literally your people like everybody is like most people are the rating you get on your life, on your personal, you just people try to equate everybody to dollar signs or to naira signs, so how much they perceive or think you have. So it's it's I think it, it's a disservice to an artist or a creative to get into that loop because um, how do I word this now? There's no there's no like the zeros to money do not end. You get so if your if your value is pegged on just money, like when does it end? You get like would would you just would, does it just have to keep rising? So your your work should have other meanings, like should have primary meanings for you. Definitely, I mean the world runs on money, so at some point you definitely sell 
get um, people to buy your art and all, but it shouldn't be the primary thing. That's just always what I try to say. Because if it's the primary thing, you get you even get discouraged early. I mean, because how many how many photographers photographers or how many artists, even the people that the OGs like the old painters, um, these old Italian painters that die, many of them their work didn't get profitable until until they were dead. You get so imagine if they needed dollar signs or money signs to make them create, to make them feel valuable. They will, will never see those beautiful works they made, you get. So until you're able to separate your 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 the value of your work from at the actual fiat money, like you might you might never really have that have that um that that mind, that's that settled mind to, to create here. Yeah. Okay. You said like until but like what's What's the process? How how do they do that? Like, what what is there a question that you have to ask yourself? So I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God, and my value is based off on who God calls me, who God says I am. So first of, I already, I already, I like, I know who I am already. So there's no, I'm not, I'm, I'm what God says I am. So already, like, literally, this me, like, literally telling you my confessions, like my synesis, literally who, who I am based on all of. So it's not it's not by the number of the thousand of dollars that I get, I have or I don't have that makes me me, you get. So if everybody gets to be, be grounded on this, on the, like in themselves, in like, I, I want to believe in God for everybody because, yeah. So if you get to find your value, in who God made you, it helps because if you don't, you literally be swayed on, like you literally go everywhere. Hmm? So I have a higher sense of purpose than just say same way. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Now, to wrap yeah, up, the conversation right? that came up recently on how, even for instance, for, uh, for like talking like generally now, for, um, Business wise, it's advised that you will have like a an alternative means of earning because if like because if you for instance we have photographers now that that um that that people literally price you peanuts because like they just think oh the market is saturated oh someone will pick it so someone might need a portrait done or and, and just say oh okay I have say ten k have twenty k. And they feel if you say no, someone else will say yes. That kind of thing. And imagine, imagine having someone having that kind of mindset on your, on your, on your work, on your business. So if you have, if you like, you have other means of um, earning. So it helps because you're able to just say no and keep creating. Then eventually, your work, will, the value of your work will rise, and you be like people that are, you attract the people that are actually your your, your market. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So have a, another source of income, if possible, or even if possible. If, 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 even in the same photography, you can you can do you, you can do other things. For instance, I, I shoot events. I shoot events with um, um, Vetella Studios. It's a like different business. So when I'm on the street, maybe weekends when we have like jobs, we get to do the job. So it's a different arrangement. It's not. It's not a do or die. I don't know if you understand. Like as much as possible, tend towards ease. Life is not that hard. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now you brought it up. So for Tell Us Studios, because <laughs> the amount of research we did for this interview, we, we know everything. <laughs> so we know about Tell Us Studios. But like, how do you? Um, is it like fifty fifty with your partner? How, how do you run it? Is, is it? is it very simple like that? Do you like how, how do you guys run the back end? Don't worry. How, how, how we run our business is how we run our business. It's not open for it's not um Nigerian budget where we have to declare to federal like to everybody. It's not it's not <laughs> cake. We need to give that energy to those in government. Let them tell us how they how they run. <laughs> true, 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 true. Now, okay. So, how did that? Um, for people that don't know, what is Vertella Studios, and how did the collaboration come about? 
Yes, yeah, so uh, for teller means storyteller. So the idea came about sometime in 2018 or 2019, 2018. So uh, Femi Awubuku, he's, he, he, like, he had, he had always, he's always been a um, wedding photographer. And me at the time, I, I told you, I started as an events photographer. So uh, we decided to, um, I, I was running Oxano Photography at the time, but wedding outfit as well. But I knew that I was like I wasn't giving it my best, so I needed I needed support. And he like so we more like complimented each other. He he he's a he's a he's a more he's more corporate headed, and we are more oh I just want to shoot that kind of. So it was a very good um, good collaboration, and yeah, that was how it started. Mm -hmm. And you guys are still active. Yeah, Tell us to steal. Yeah, because yeah, I think I went I went on the page and I believe like last post was like July. So I wasn't sure. I was like, okay. Social media is not a bread and butter, but we try. I guess so, I guess so, I guess You know, some, some photographers like they don't like they have to post every single day. If not, people believe that business is not going <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that well. Instagram. But that's like depending on the person. Yeah, Instagram has made it even harder now. The pictures are not even enough. Like you have to be dancing, you have to post reels and stuff. So it's it's just hard. <laughs> but, but now you have to put your photos in reels if you want to get seen. So that's us. You know, Instagram wants to be TikTok, but let's not let's not talk about that. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. So talking about that, like I I recently said, um, does this. Um, Social media uh, app, Vero. I don't know if we've heard about it. Vero, yes. I, I, I got on Vero in 2020, but at the time, it, like I was just testing it out, and it looked it looks good. It looked it looked. I mean, it still looks good, but at the time, like I wasn't sure what it was. But at this, as I speak, I think it's getting bigger, and uh, more creatives are leaning towards Vero because it's it's. It's more like Instagram without the noise, like more more focused. Yeah. Mm -hmm. True, true. But okay, so let's let's put a button button on that before Instagram comes in and takes us off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So now to wrap things up, right? When someone goes through your Instagram page, it's almost like you have the perfect quote. Every single and so can you walk us through your process of choosing a quote for your uh like for like for an image or for your photos? So like I said, well, like I said when we started, the first person that benefits from my work is me. You get so yeah when like uh, let's say, for instance, an average day I go out, use the X hundred V, go shoot around, come. Um, I shoot like I just I send JPEG from the camera to my phone, put put the images on Snapseed, like put the bars like the white borders rather. Then I literally go through each of them and see all oh, say from this day which one which of them would I like to post. When I like make a selection of say seven or ten, I just keep going through them and try to look for what I whatever I can get from the image. So it could sometimes it could be a word, it could be it could be anything, it could be say tenacity or hope or joy or whatever it is. Then I'm thinking, oh, it could like there's so there's um there are ways I could do it. I have um I have like notes. I have uh, my note on my phone where, where if I'm reading a book or I'm watching anything, there's a quote that stands out to me. I usually just write it on my notes. So most times from whatever I go for the picture, I could just go through the notes and anything that works with, like comes, like fuses with that word or whatever I got from the pictures. I imagine, like I just pick out the quote and use the quote. Alternatively, I could just go on the internet just put that very word and put quotes after it. And so sometimes like that whole action takes me maybe over an hour sometimes because I'm like, oh no, this is not it. This is not, not this one, not this one. So it's, it helps. So that way, like I get to um, 
a more like completes the meditation part of the whole, you know, when I say like the whole act of street photography for me is a meditative process. So it rounds up that process for me in that way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because going through your page, I was definitely like, yo, this guy definitely has a book of quotes somewhere <laughs> because it's every single photo. And then there's some photos where it matches like perfectly. I'm like, how long? I know this probably took a long time to Google search this. Yeah. Or maybe I was like, do you have the quote first? And then do you go out there and shoot a photo for it? But obviously it's, it's the other way around. Yeah. Makes sense. What, when, it, when it's all said and done, what do you want your legacy to be? What do you want to be from I, I don't think we get to determine our legacy. It's people like my... my <laughs> But, um, hmm. like, I think at the end of the day, I, my my biggest hope or belief or expectation is that everything, whether it's my name or my work, whatever it is that I do, I pray that it leads or it points whoever sees it or whoever is a part of it to... To God, to Jesus, because I mean, at the end of the day, it's his, it's all like he's the one that makes everything make sense. Because without God, without Jesus, we're just we're all just we're, we're wasting our time. You get so. At the end of the day, my, it's my hope, it's my prayer that people people um, come to that rest a way. It's not an idea. He's the way, he's the truth, and the life. Yeah. That's, that would be the biggest, if there's a word like that, legacy, yeah. That's what, what I hope. Makes sense, makes sense. So, Kabeti, thank you so, so much for coming on. Right now, if you have any questions for Kabeti, please type them right now. Okay, so we're going to start with the first one. It says, Obey Images says, What's the most challenging scenario? <laughs> what's the most cha- what's the most challenging scenario you've had on the street? Hmm. Do I remember? Do I have a challenge in the most the most, the most? the most challenging. Something that you cannot forget. Uh, I wish I, I wish Chris was on this call. Maybe he would help me. Uh, the most, the most, the most, the most. I don't think I remember any, any, uh, I don't think. The only, uh, what the most challenging, no, I'm, I'm not sure I remember, but the, the, the one I, I might be able to remember would be um, like the kind of like, the, there are days when it goes out and it's, and it's like, I, I go out, uh, maybe I head out and it's like, everything is just speaking to me. Like, it's like, like every picture, you know, you know, people think street photography. Like people see pictures and just think, oh, you, oh, it's, it's just you just go out and take those pictures. But most times, <laughs> you might, you might, you might, you might walk ten thousand to twelve thousand steps, and you don't even have like ten pictures. You get so. But there are days where I'm, maybe I've barely walked two hundred, five hundred steps. Like everything is speaking to me. So um, those are kind of days that I remember and. They, they've been happening like they've been happening very often lately. But for challenging, I'm not sure I remember. I don't know what cha- he means by challenging. Like you mean challenging as in oh difficult, how difficult it was, or I'm not sure. I'm not sure I remember. Mm-hmm. But when I when I and so when I lived in Yanopaja, I think there was a, mm-hmm. there was a situation in the market and not in the bus park where they were fighting. Like area boys were like they were train they were train blue and. And that day, <laughs> that day, I I wanted to take a picture. Funny enough, I saw the picture on like not long ago. And as I was trying to take a picture, I remembered a friend of mine. He told me that he was he was like they beat him up around that same spot. I, I took the picture. So uh, there was a lot of conflict within me, like because something I would normally not even think about. You get. But like, but because of the information I had, so I was like, "Oh, should I take it? Should I not take it?" But at the end of the day, I took the picture, but not maybe as close as I would have wanted to take it. But yeah, that was been that was a challenge. But it's been a while ago. Like I think it was twenty sixteen or seventeen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, well, 
piggybacking off that, do you ever use a zoom lens or uh, no, no to like maybe like on his lip, let, let me not get punched, let me zoom in. <laughs> and you just like you using a zoom lens won't give you that like it, it won't give you that that um being being the field it, it's easily like i mean no like you can you there are people that use the photographers that use zoom lenses on the street and it's interesting i mean especially for those that do portrait but for the kind of pictures um, i mean for the kind of pictures i'm hoping to get i have to be there like it's about me being there it's that connection that that makes it work for me mm, makes sense makes sense okay here's an interesting question by May and underscore photographer. He says, how does being a street photographer put food on your table? How do you make money as a street photographer? So, street photography, it's like, um, you can you can like make money from selling prints, making prints. Like I did a print sales, print sale like a year or two ago. There's, there are avenues, through which you can make uh, money doing street photography. But one of the things that street photography also does is it's like training ground for me. So with the training I get doing streets, I'm able to do assignments. Like when I get to do um, do like documentary assignments for organizations, that training, that skill gotten from doing the street helps like my other work. Or even when I'm shooting weddings, like I'm able to like it helps, it literally helps me. I don't know if you get so. There's the there's the straight up way to make money doing street. Whether you're doing books, you're selling books, or you're doing prints, or you're doing um. Now there's the there's the NFTs that people do now. Like there are like more ways are coming up. Maybe miles of ways are springing up every other day. But there's that part, and there's the part where it informs. It helps my other assignments here. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Now here's a question that you pretty much already answered already. And, and it's obviously, obviously, like you said, the most asked question. Person says, I'm scared that they'll attack me. What do I do? I want to be a documentary photographer. Or you should or just be a good person. Right? Stay in your house. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> so the, the, the answer would be, I guess, not everyone the world is like, like looking to like the thing is this just go go out like go out like even without your camera go out and maybe stand at the bus stop and try to see you can be there for an hour nobody even notices you so my point is many of us we think we think too much of ourselves like we are so self-conscious thinking oh why do you think is you they are looking for to be like people are busy about their daily like you don't know for instance Lagos for instance like if I'm standing at Odota like people are busy. That's what I'm trying to say. Like nobody is specifically standing at the bus stop waiting for you to, to either rough you up or beat you up. So as long as you don't like, you know that you're not you, oh jolly, you're not stealing or anything. I don't think you should. You should like come on. You're not. You're not the center of people's universe. Like be yourself. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. I. I but. Like you said, like, that's like the most asked question when it comes to street photography. Yeah, so <laughs> you should put it. You should put the answer I, I, in your bio. So this, I don't have this. One of the things that help is this. You know, there's something. Um, there's the. Um, there's something. There's a line people say, being a being a fly on the wall. Mm. How you be a fly on the wall is by presence. Like you can, you'll be so in a place where you'll be so there that. You, that people don't see you anymore. There's always an analogy I try to use. The closer, I mean, the closer somebody gets to your eyes, the less of, of, of the person you see. Have you tried it before? Like, now mm -hmm. I could be covering your vision, but when I get close, your eyes literally see, your eyes sees past that um, obstruction. So mm -hmm. you can be so in people's, you can be so much in someone's face where you literally disappear. So one of the things I, I, I do is, I, I just, sometimes I just hang my camera go hang out at the bus stop. Literally, I, maybe I could go for a day or two and not even take pictures. I'm just literally there, just hanging out. Sorry, what's my wife saying here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> She's shouting you out. <laughs> so, so I can just literally um, 
stand like just hang out there like talk to people you go, I mean mo- the biggest game like I always say is not the pictures is the connection you make so there are times when I just maybe walk out hang around and people are the ones asking me ah take my picture now then I just start joking oh do you will you pay can you pay and so you know all of a sudden I, I switch that uh, when 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 you ask someone, can you pay? The person already thinks, uh, uh, oh, how you're not so okay, fine. Let me take it. So it now self, it now looks like a gift. It doesn't now, it doesn't seem like oh, you're you're taking something from them, that like you're giving them a gift. Mm-hmm. I sometimes offer to send them the picture on WhatsApp or like there are various ways. It's not that hard. Maybe I'm not doing a good job explaining how similar it is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you mentioned one thing, right? So when you're out on the streets taking photos. Do you ever go back and maybe print the photo out and give the person you took a photo of or a time to do that? Yeah, I've done that. Uh, I've done that maybe once or twice. But what I do mostly is to get their WhatsApp number, get their numbers and send them, send it to them on WhatsApp. Yeah. Is that a thing you, you always do? Right? The film is expensive. So I don't know how many people will print, print for from... My Instax, in my, in my, and I don't think people. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's it's more sustainable to rather send them on WhatsApp than to print the photos. But when I can print photos, I do print photos. Yeah. Now, like sending on WhatsApp, do you do that every single time or once in a while? Once in a while, when the person like when it's a when I take when is the portrait? You know, I usually don't like. I'm not. I don't set out to take portraits of people. Like maybe maybe also that yeah. those specializes in portraits. So, but there are times when maybe someone like maybe gets my attention. Uh, like there was a picture I posted like some is it two days ago. So I was just walking and the guy was like, "I should take his picture now." I just I, we had that whole back and forth again. Oh, will you pay me? He now smiled. I was like, "I'll take my picture now." So I just went took his picture, got his WhatsApp, uh, but he, he oh he didn't have his phone actually. But I said, "Oh, I'll pay him next time." He leaves around the lap area. Yeah. It makes sense, makes sense. Now, I think there are two or three more questions, but you can pick the one you want to choose if you want. Just one, scroll down. One more, but my wife like me see me like she said. <laughs> no, I mean, no, like, you know, if you want, you can choose a you can choose a, a question you want to answer before I ask you <laughs> ten more. <laughs> when you get your cameras and gear. Okay, uh, where I got my cameras and get camera joint. Camera joint is the plug. I believe we we know what camera joint is. Um, street photographers have to be agbo. No, that's that's actually a misconception. This person says street photographers have to be agbo pro max. Nah, I think that will backfire. You don't like. I mean, you don't go to people's home and try to load in their home you get, or people's zone, and try to load in their zone. So as much as possible, you need to be human. You know, we talked about being a per- person, like having, like, let your personality go before your photography. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, There's a question what, here, what, what? Scroll all the way down. Behind you. Okay. What's the uh, motivation? <laughs> I'll be at home on a good round about 6 p.m. shops. <laughs> That's my friend. Um, what's the motivation behind your portraits? Motivation? Uh, I'm not sure. So I don't think I have. There's not like, so usually there's something I read from, I know people have been bashing her lately. She's a portrait photographer. Um, she's based, I can just have a sound mind. Um, so, she said something about portraits on how it's don't don't pre-plan portraits like it should be about the the environment and the person so i don't necessarily go out thinking oh i want to take this kind of portrait or so literally i just go and work with what i see like it should be more about the person and the environment than pre-planned um, ideas i think that's all sure sure if you guys have any more questions, oh, wait, we have a question from Mr. Kule Omu. <laughs> he says, what's your favorite city out of Lagos to shoot? Hmm. I like Enugu. <laughs> so Enugu is one of my favorite cities in the country because, I mean, 
I, I did some of my schooling there, and I think it's one of the best cities in the country. I really like to shoot in it. It's my one of my favorite spots to shoot. Then Lagos, obviously, I love Lagos. Like my Lagos is. Someone said, um, "Thank you." I that most people suggest collaboration. Uh, I'm not sure I have an answer for this question. What's the question? Um, I think something by Enigma Studio. He said, thank you for the opportunity. I would like to ask what a rising photographer should do. Most people suggest collaboration, but I I do not really, oh, but it does not really yield so much in bringing in the client. Mm, so there's, we know, we know, I believe we all know Gazmadu. Gazmadu is somebody I respect, and she's been doing some classes on the business of photography, how to attract your kind of client, how to price your, your work. I think it's something that we should, like, especially um, Edigma, I'm talking to you now, I think it's something you should consider. Um, that's one thing a lot of us photographers don't, we don't, um, I think we, it's not something we, we, we're intentional about. I think we should be intentional about building ourselves. And if it costs you money to do it, you're always better off whatever you pay for something, you always get more than it at the end of the day. So mm. I'm saying this because a lot of people, when people just hear workshops or hear, and they just zone out because they think they're trying to get my money. I'll, I'll see it on YouTube. Well, YouTube, mm. YouTube literally just spits out. It doesn't get, you don't receive, you don't, there's no feedback. There's no, you can't bounce off whatever it is you, you're thinking. So when people make out time to, um, to organize trainings, always try to, it's still that whole idea of money. Like, you know, people, when people talk, when people, when I say stuff about it, people just think, oh, it's, 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 you're talking about, um, are you, are you trying to say you don't, people should not make money? But that idea still stops people from spending money. So it's not just about making money. It's about, I'll be fluid about money. When you have an opportunity to get something like valuable knowledge, be able to, like, you should, you should look at spending for it. Mm-hmm. I now things that I'm seeing a question from our guy Kule. I, 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 I think that it's almost gone. But he says, "How how's Ghana in comparison to Nigeria?" Oh, oh no, I'll, I'll start with the last Kule, one. Kule is my guy. <laughs> um, yeah, Kule. KJ, how you doing? Okay, so um, Ghana is. I think it's more relaxed. Ghana is actually a beautiful place to shoot. I enjoyed my time in Ghana. I mean, shout out to Obey Images, to Nipa, to Miss Pa, to Gerald, to everybody. Like, Ghana was so amazing. They're they are generally more, they are more chilled. It's as if there's a, there's a rewind button in Ghana. They are not as, as fast as we are. So it's, it's easier to, to, to move around. And people are just more relaxed. In Lagos, our blood is open. We just want to jump onto them. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. All right, man. And that right there is a wrap. Thank you so much for coming on Thank today. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, yeah. Now, before you go, do you want to promote anything, an upcoming class, a project, a mentee program? No. Nah, anything? No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm good. No, nothing. Just, I just want to say thank you and to every one of my fellow photographers. Keep creating, keep putting in the work, and uh, like, like we already agreed. Like, there are other things to to focus on beyond money. Don't, don't, don't fight me. Don't beat me. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> now, let me outro this thing real quick. So it's like this. So. My name is Tunde. This is another episode of NPH Live Photography Conversations. You can watch or listen to this episode and all our future episodes on YouTube and Spotify. Last but not least, I want to thank you for watching. And I, I'm Kabeni. NPH and Kabeni will see you guys later.